Please help me welcome to the stage founder and CEO of Zeta, Bob and Tarakia. It's really exciting to be here talking to all of you folks today about AI. I'm, I'm, I'm privileged to be sharing the stage at CBA Live. And as Lindsay mentioned, I'm the co-founder and CEO at Zeta. We're a next-gen banking tech company. And my intention is to take the next um, 15 minutes, um, 15 to 20 minutes, and, and narrate two tales of what I believe will be an awe-inspiring future on how conversational AI and decisioning, yeah, I kind of divide them into these two parts. Um, um, we'll redefine banking and financial services and, and, and um, the landscape over the next decade. So without further ado, let's actually start with the, the first tale that illustrates the power of uh, conversational AI. It's called conversational AI and the agent. And um, you know, long before um, AI and smartphones and the cloud, all interactions in banking were human to human, right? You would go into a branch, you'd meet a manager, you'd meet, meet a teller, and they were your interface to the bank, you know, for support, for decisions, for knowledge, for information. And, and this human interface uh, was essentially constrained by two factors. You know, a human has limited con compute. I have a average sized head, so physical constraint, you know, constrained by the physical capacity of my brain. And, and humans also have limited access to data, whatever data we can pull from, you know, a centralized computer uh, in that particular scenario. So you've got this human interface to banking that was limited by both compute and, and by data. And we fast forward to the present and we find ourselves in the, in the age of apps. You know, consumers are using apps, um, self-servicing uh, various banking needs, you know, asking information about their transactions, managing their cards, their accounts, et cetera. And apps are not constrained by compute or data. Apps have uh, unlimited access to compute in the cloud. They can access all your information in terms of data, pull information and records about any consumer, any, um, any transaction, et cetera, but compared to conversational AI, which I believe is the next paradigm for interaction in, in every sphere and in industry, specifically including banking, compared to conversational AI, apps do have three specific constraints that I want to show you, demonstrate to you with examples, right? And uh, we'll start with an example of a customer of a bank. It could be any of your banks out here. Let's call him John. You know, John has a credit card with, um, with your bank and, and wants to create a add-on card for their child, let's call him Sam, and this is a uh, conversation between um, John and, and, and an AI agent, right? an AI bot, or conversational AI um, agent, and so, you know, after collecting all the relevant information, the agent asks, you know, their name, their phone number, their email address, and so after collecting all the relevant information, uh, you know, this is a, a, a family card, a child's card, so rightfully so. Agent asks John, would you like to place any restrictions on your, on your child's add-on card? And, and you know, John being the responsible, strict parent says, yeah, of course, I, I want him to be only able to spend $150 each month. I, I want him to only be able to spend, um, use that card within a sort of college campus. Um, and you know, I want to turn off the card every day at 10 p.m. I don't want to make any late night spends and, and going out in the night and partying and so on and so forth. And so sure enough, basically, as, as would be the case, the conversational um, AI agent complies and uh, ends the conversation completing that task after having provided suggestions, recommendations, collecting all the information, says, you know, here's a card, it's been created, it's been limited, you know, $150 a month. Um, Agent detected that, that Sam studies in NYU, so this card can only be used, say, within a half a mile radius of NYU, and, and um, it's only gonna be available, or it's only gonna be valid or operational between you know, 9 a.m. and 10 p.m. each day, and I've already dispatched to Sam. Now, this is a um, sophisticated, I would say, conversation with a conversational AI agent. The point I wanna illustrate, as I said, I wanna talk about three specific constraints that differentiate and distinguish a conversational AI paradigm from, from using apps. And, and before I get to the first one, imagine this, the same flow inside an app, right? This exact same flow for John inside one of your um, banking apps. It would be a series of forms. So John would click on a button that says, you know, I wanna add a card, and they would fill out a form with like Sam's information, and then specify a bunch of spend limits in, in the next page, and eventually create a card, right? It would be a series of different forms. And that brings me to the first key difference between conversational AI and apps. 
which is that in an app, the app directs the flow. So if the app first asks for card information, that's what John's got to fill. If it then asks for spend limits, that's what John's going to do. The app directs, the app is the conductor and the app is directing the flow. In conversational AI, it's the exact opposite. John directs the flow of the conversation, right? And, and this subtle difference is important because John can now direct that conversation in the way that feels most natural to John. Apps have a cognitive load. Right? You have to learn the interface. You adopt an app, you have to learn the interface, you learn how to use it. Conversational AI has no cognitive load because every one of us has been learning the interface since the time we were three years old. It has no cognitive load. That's the first key difference. Now, second as a corollary, in an app, the flow is identical for every single individual. You know, John, Jacob, Jason, they could all go through this flow. They will see the exact same screens in the exact same order with the exact same fields. Whereas in conversational AI, the flow by its very nature is personalized for each individual. And that's the second key difference. Conversational AI by default is hyper-personalized. Now to illustrate the third and final difference, uh, let's take another example, right? Um, we're gonna move on to a second conversation John's having with a, uh, an AI agent, you know, show me my last five transactions. And the bot responds back, you know, you spent a bunch of money at Whole Foods and, and Amazon and Starbucks and whatever not. This is, you know, pretty straightforward. Nothing you wouldn't see in, in, a, in an app. But let's look at the next question that John asks out here. So he says, how much am I spending on groceries each month, right? And the agent responds, saying your average monthly spend on groceries is $225. And by the way, here's a pretty little chart that shows you your average spend on a monthly basis on groceries for the last six months, right? We're already in the realm of what is beyond the possibility of apps. And then let's, let's take, take this a step forward, you know, then let's look at the next question. So John's now gonna ask, well, you know, how does my grocery spend compare to others? And this is where there's an opportunity for conversationally to really turn that conversation into magic. So you've got a response here that says, you know, you have two adults and two children in your household. The median monthly grocery spend for a similar household in New York, which is where John is, you know, in your income bracket is $250. So if you're spending $225, you're better off than the median, right? And, and, and this brings me to my third and final observation or point about conversational AI is that apps are constrained by code. You can't do this in an app, but conversational AI can leverage generative AI, which goes substantially beyond the realm of just fetching simple information can provide insight can provide wisdom and that's the third key point you know, conversational AI is not constrained by code so there you have it it's a three pillars that I wanted to talk about in the first tale uh, for, an, for a conversational AI agent which is uh, there's no cognitive load you know you're not learning a new interface there's no cognitive load so it feels natural it's hyper personalized by default so it feels unique to the consumer. It's not constrained by code, so it feels limitless. And with that, we come to a um, conclusion of our first tale on, uh, on conversational AI and, and the agent, uh, character of the, of the story. And let's begin with our, our second tale, uh, another area in AI that I'm particularly fascinated by, uh, which is decisioning AI. And so tale two is about decisioning AI and, and the wizard. Um, and here again, let's talk about the evolution of decision making, right? So back in the day, decisions were entirely led by human experience. So if you went to a doctor, um, you know, decades ago, they would basically make decisions. They've seen thousands of patients before. They're going to analyze patterns based on what they've experienced before. And they're going to make decisions, diagnostic, um, you know, decisions and on your ailments based on their past experience, right? Bankers 
made decisions relying on their wisdom and judgment about loans, about investments, providing advice to customers. So these decisions, these experience-led decisions, however, were essentially constrained by, um, by subjectivity, you know, by subjectivity of, of, of humans. And um, there's a, a famous quote by Jim Barksdale that goes, you know, if we have data, let's look at data. But if all we have are opinions, let's just go with mine. Um, and, and human decisions are often opinions based on intuition and beliefs as opposed to data. And any, any good banker, any good risk manager here will tell you that intuition has no place in banking. And so we kind of moved on to phase two in the evolution of decision making, which is, uh, which is data assisted decisions. We started incorporating data. So you've got doctors start looking at, you know, diagnostics and lab results and imaging to diagnose ailments. And then bankers start looking at um, income statements and historical financials and credit scores to approve loans. And so access to data moved us from this notion of subjective decision making to reasonably objective decision making, right? That's the second phase of, of evolution of decision making. But this phase of, of data assisted decisions, while it's no longer constrained by subjectivity of humans, um, it's still constrained by scalability of humans, right? We were first constrained by subjectivity. Now we're constrained by scalability. And I want to illustrate this point with a quote by Henry Ford, which says, um, you know, if you need a machine and don't buy it, then, then you'll ultimately find that you've basically paid for it, but don't have it. Right? And, this, and the not so subtle point illustrated in this quote is that humans are not inherently scalable. So if you do not employ machines where you can, where you should, then you will invariably find that you ended up paying the price for it in the terms of opportunity cost or lost efficiency, but without actually owning the machine. And, and that's what I wanna talk about in this phase three, which is, I believe, um, I'm taking an optimistic view here that in the next 10 years, much like a wizard, AI will be capable and will potentially, in many cases, run the entire bank, delivering unprecedented return on equity and maintaining 100% regulatory compliance. In fact, banking, I submit, is actually the number one industry that is fundamentally conducive to embracing this transformative leap. And, and let me explain why. Um, I'm gonna geek out a little bit here. Um, but basically, if you think about banking, and again, all of us are all too familiar with this, all of banking can be distilled into a single mathematical equation, right? Here's a simplified version. It's, you know, return on assets, which is, as we all know, the holy grail of banking is income minus expenses over assets. And you've got all your income lines, you know, interchange, fee income, interest income, et cetera. You've got your expense lines. And every single decision that every one of us in this room takes on a daily basis, data assisted or otherwise, on a consistent basis is, to, is seeking to optimize the output of this one mathematical equation, right? This is the ultimate KPI when it comes to banking, which is we're always trying to optimize return on assets. You know, granted there's other variables like customer NPS and CSAT, whatever not. Um, you know, the equation has a series of input levers. Um, the input levers are nothing but various decisions. So you've got um, underwriting decisions. Who should I lend money to? Line management decisions. How much money should I lend to them? Um, fraud decisions. Who should I reject? Um, fees and interest decisions. Like how much should I charge them? Reward decisions, which is how much should I reward them? And all of these decisions are we make consistently and continuously to optimize this one variable, which is return on assets. And in the coming years, I believe sophisticated deep learning models will act as universal decisioning wizards that can fine tune each and every one of these variables, these input levers on a per customer, per account, per transaction basis to provide unprecedented ROA maximization in a sustainable way. Imagine you will have at your disposal a team of, you know, AI, Algorithms, if you will, that act like, you know, represent mathematicians, programmers, analysts, portfolio managers, um, you know, copywriters, compliance officers who never sleep, 
who leverage next-gen processing platforms to get access to any data about all your customers, be able to process that data, be able to perform any actions on behalf of a customer at the level of an account, at the level of a transaction, in real time, with real-time feedback. And that basically is the, is the conclusion of the second story. I, I want to leave you with this, uh, this quote. You know, um, we as humans, we, we always tend to overestimate what we can achieve in a year, but we invariably grossly underestimate what we can achieve in 10 years. And, and this is why, this is because it's, it's hard to even, as humans, even as bankers, it's actually hard to wrap our minds around the concept of compounding um, uh, for some reason. And, and, and so it's my belief that the final frontier of, of both conversational AI and decisioning AI will have a compounding effect on optimizing ROA, which is the holy grail of banking. You know, many of you folks have spent several decades in, in, in banking, but I can promise you the next decade will be the most revolutionary decade you've witnessed in your lives. Thank you very much.